Well, good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here with everyone. My name is Gary Carno. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Who knew that I would have a YouTube channel two weeks ago? I'm here today with uh, a lot of friends and everyone who's on today is either a family member or a friend. And most of us are all connected because we at one time were part of Donald Freed's writing class. And so all of us have interconnections and connections. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to our guests, Richard Benjamin and Paula Prentice, and they will take it from here. Hi, Gary, and thank you. Uh, we're so pleased to be here for a lot of reasons. And you say relationships and how long you've known anybody. Well, we've known Mitch for 58 years. Isn't that right, Mitch? Because uh, <laughs> we lost track of him in the middle somewhere. But now that we have the book, we know everything he was up to. We did As You Like It in Central Park in the Joe Pepp's uh, Shakespeare in the Park. And Mitch and Paula were acting in the production. I was in the production but I don't think I was actually acting because I had no idea what I was saying. Um, and Mitch, you had some dogs in that. Didn't you have hounds? I had two huge hounds. So he was so brave to come on stage with these. I, would, I had to make an entrance with both of them. Make an entrance with those dogs, <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh uh, I made an entrance not knowing what I was saying, but the <laughs> two of you and Penny Fuller were absolutely great. So 58 years, pretty good, huh? Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad. And uh, the great one of the great things about your wonderful book is that we see this great journey uh, that your life took and from when we all, you know, sprung off of that stage uh, in the park. Um, and uh, what I find is that one of the great things about this book, and there are many, is that all, a lot of us here uh, watching and being on this, uh, uh, on this Zoom right now have heard you read sections of the book, which were the reading was always remarkable. But I find that in actually being alone and reading your book, it's a very different experience. They're both brilliant. But being alone reading the book does something in a bigger sense somehow. Uh, later, I'd like you to read a section that I, that I marked off here. Um, and the other thing that I find is that looking at your brilliant career uh, and thinking uh, as an actor, uh, something I always admired was the length and breadth of your career from you know, doing all these classic plays from the Greeks and Shakespeare, working with Judith Anderson and all of these amazing people that you work with. And now to see that you've written this beautiful book and the writing is so magnificent. And now I have to admire you as a writer and I, <laughs> and I don't think it's fair. <laughs> I just don't think it's fair. Wasn't the acting thing enough? Did you, <laughs> did you have to go do this too? I mean, really, there are some of us who have just a few skills. Yes. <laughs> we don't need you to do this. So don't do this again, okay? Um, and uh, the other thing that uh, I find, and then I'd like you to read this uh, particular passage in the afterward of the book, um, it's mentioned that it's more than an actor's life, which it certainly is. Um, but it's even more than that, I find reading it. It's a universal life. Um, and it's a life lived, you know, backwards and forwards and to the hilt for sure. Um, but I was left with something that gave me uh, a wonderful insight into just being alive. That one of the things that I wrote, and I, I, I wrote and that quote that I uh, was so happy to have in the book is that you explored the astonishment of living. So it's yes, an actor's life, and yes, it's your personal life, but something in there 
is even larger. Um, and it's just, it's just be beautifully done with real insights into living. And here's a, here's a passage that, and there's a great sentence in this passage. Uh, I mean, if I have to say there's one great sentence among these great sentences, I think it's this one. Do you want to read this? It's on page 190. Oh, yes. I was going to read. Just, just read. I'll show you the passage. Okay. Page 190. Yeah. I could read it myself if you like, because yeah, I'm, would you? Yeah, that might be nice. <laughs> I'm an actor and I could read it. Uh, can I direct you? <laughs> yes, you can. Yes. Yes. We, we I'd like to say different. before we go on. Yeah. Richard uh, has written a most beautiful and magnificent book, which uh, He's very choosy about producers, so he can't get them to print it. But no, I, I know where he it will is. at any moment. Yeah, it's in a drawer somewhere. That's where it is. <laughs> That's well, where it Richard, is. I just have to say, we're going to pull it out of that drawer before the, the night's over, if you have time. Oh, we'll see about that. All right. So, Mitch, go to page one ninety. All right. And this, do you are you there? Yeah. Okay. That sentence that starts. They were both startled. This is right before your mother passes away. You see that section? It yes. Is. Mm -hmm. Read that section. Uh, they were both startled. Let me see. Uh, you see it there? I can't find it now. Uh, on, one, on 190? 190. Go to the bottom. Oh, yeah. They were both startled. Yeah, start there and end with uh, before I'm sorry, mother, okay? They were both startled, then quiet. He wanted to run to her, fall in her lap, beg to be forgiven. Instead, he watched, watched her hand fluttering around her stricken face. He hung on to the door as if it would escape, the door knob as if it would escape. She sat lost in a dream of otherwise. After a while, she rallied and looked at him. You mustn't talk to me like that, Mitchell. It hurts me. You know nothing about me and my life. You have never bothered to ask. I just think that's so beautiful. The, um, the, the uh, holding the doorknob at, as if it would escape, and the other line, which I think is maybe the best sentence in the book, she sat lost in a dream of otherwise. That's, that's pretty good. Thank you. That's pretty good. I know you played Hemingway, but. <laughs> You're right there. You're right there. You have anything, my darling? No, that's a beautiful, beautiful scene, though. Yeah. yeah. I remember well, uh, my mother died, and it was something. Yeah. Um, all right. Is there something uh, that you'd like to read, or something in, in particular? Let me let me just see here. Uh, I didn't. Well, oh, the one. the other thing I the other thing I wanted to say. <laughs> along with everything else, and I don't want to forget this, that as beautiful as the book is, as insightful it is, as it is, I think it took a lot of courage to write this book because it's, as they say, it, it's everything. You don't leave anything out, the good, the bad, and the ugly, none of it. And I think most people would kind of edit a bit, couch it a bit, but you don't do that. And that is a great gift to us, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of the things that I think we admire about you, but about the book itself. Uh, and that there's no escape from the realness of it because you don't censor anything. You take responsibility, you say all the mistakes, and you also show 
uh, all the glorious things that you know have come out of all of all, all of this. So courage and bravery, I think, should be attributed to you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Richard. I uh, I uh, have to constantly um, say to people who don't know me or who want the book that it's that it is mainly about forgiving and trying to find out what happened in the relationship with my mother and with my father and with my son. And of course, I have to get into the, to the uh, career and I do quite a bit and I make a lot of relationships there that I have to deal with. And, uh, <clears throat> Here's a here's a, a <clears throat> section of the book early when I'm about 22 years old, and um, the other happened. Uh, what Richard and I were reading happens like 30 years later or so. So this is early on, and I've come back from the Navy and, and I've gotten into the. A little theater in that town in Louisville. So I come home to the director told me to read Hamlet. Uh, and I said, what was that? And, and so uh, he told me what it was. And I was uh, flabbergasted. And I said, Well, my mother has a complete copy of, of uh, the Sha all the Shakespeare plays. So I went home and I asked her if I could read it. And she said, of course, and she thrust the large volume into my hands, but it does not leave this house. She turned back to the fireplace, read it slowly, read it out loud. In his back room, he plowed through the words. After several hours, he began to understand some of the language. He sensed his mother waiting in the living room, but was pretty sure she wouldn't come back here. He continued, <clears throat> some of the passages were a large mouthful, some were contemporary, sounded like nowadays. Others he couldn't follow, even when he read them over several times. He heard a sound, turned to see her at the door. Where are you? Mitch flushed, stuttered, uh, sat up on the edge of the bed. Well, um, the king just uh, welcomed Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and told them to keep an eye on Hamlet. I'm trying to find out who Voltaman is. Oh, he's the ambassador to Norway. She had a tea towel in her hand and was swinging it like a cowboy, ready to rope a cow. Her face was open. She looked young. She tucked the towel into her belt and startled him by doing a little jig and slapping her foot Irish style. For as long as he could remember, he'd never seen her so full of life. She laughed, he laughed. She laughed, and they both laughed together. Well, what do you think so far? Well, I don't know. The part with his father, you know, the ghost seemed a bit far-fetched. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You have to remember, Mitchell, that in those days, the Elizabethan times, everyone believed in ghosts and they were very real to the audience. She came in and sat beside him. Also a woman alone, she paused, and he watched as she seemed to fall back somewhere into the past. Especially a queen almost always married right away to protect herself. Oh boy, you know a lot about this play. My father read Hamlet to me when I was a wee thing. Your father read it to me when I first met him. She gave a small laugh. 
the picture of his father reading Shakespeare, and to his mother, no less, seemed almost impossible to believe. Her voice was deep and throaty. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculty! In form and moving, how express and admirable! In action, how like an angel! In apprehension, how like a god! The beauty of the world! The paragon of animals! She stopped, shut her eyes, turned away. Her voice changed when she started again. Mitch sensed the sadness. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. They were both quiet. Mitch made a movement toward her, stopped, caught between embarrassment and an impulse to touch her in some way. But before he could move, she reached out and patted the heavy worn book. I love Shakespeare. She began, and then, sensing his need, moved away to the window. I fell in love with your father when he read Shakespeare to me. When she turned back to him, her face was so different that he hardly recognized her. Her cheeks were full of color, her eyes wide and alive. My father used to read also, fate that I should meet a man who loved Shakespeare and love to read. Now, my son is a reader. She slowly floated to the door. Mitch didn't want her to go. Are you going to play Hamlet? Oh, no, no, not me. But I think maybe you should. She turned to go. Stay, Mom, please, and read some. She shook her head, smiled. And then almost to herself, she said, he was for all time and was gone. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I also think that uh, that was so beautiful that on the actor's level, there are some great things like he didn't want to pick up the phone because he knew that it could be something disturbing. But for an actor, when the phone rings, yeah. That's all you're waiting for. This could be a job. This so could you're, be caught, it. You're, you're caught in this thing. A, a, someone may be calling with a tragedy. You've got to pick up the phone. There yeah. could be a job there. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, what would, would any, should we open this up, uh, Mitch, or do you want to read another passage? Well, I have another one. Yeah, Good. read that. Yeah, read that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Mitch, you could read the phone book and you would have us enthralled. <laughs> <laughs> Not with my ragged voice today. Yeah. Gary, there are no more phone books. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You no, know, the only trouble I'm having with the reading is I heard a lot of its and those. <laughs> I'm not allowed to use it. Anymore. I told you that uh, Donald thought it would be better to take the he said, she said out because I had a lot of them in. Uh, and, he, and he said, Hemingway, uh, I mean, uh, Faulkner used that as part of his rhythm. And so I took them all out. And the editor at the um, publishing company put them all back in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And How's that? A minute. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Are you going to read another passage? Yes, I will. Oh, great. I just, uh, he just got a job in a Clint Eastwood Western, which uh, he's sort of thrilled about. And uh, he's gotten down to the Highlands Inn, which turns out to be, uh, he thought it was something out of Wuthering Heights, and it turned out to be a motel. <clears throat> but he walked outside across the parking lot to a large stand of pine trees and looked up at the endless dark peaks lit by the moon that circled the valley. He breathed deeply and began to sense a connection with his surroundings. The moon was there, the mountains were there, the parking lot, the pine trees, the warm wind, a new feeling as if he had never lived before. Yet everything seemed ages old and familiar. A new kind of living energy filled his body and mind. He raised his arms and waved them around, turning like a dervish. Awake, alert, alive, he walked back to the motel. He had been dead for years, dead with fear and loathing. And now he was awakened, resurrected. His sense of dread was gone. He was a human being who actually belonged. On the first day of shooting, the cast walked around the set in their Western outfits. The set was a work of art built on the shores of a saltwater lake, Mono Lake, in the middle of a huge basin formed by ancient volcanic eruptions. The town included a big broad main street and a working bar and several stables. Every day he felt renewed, couldn't wait to get to the set. Bob, a cast member who was also an expert in the natural history and the recent history of the region, told Mitch everything he knew on the bus coming out to location each day. Mitch couldn't get enough of the history of these mountains and the men who settled them. No one had too big a burden in the film and they played together and over several weeks became an ensemble. They, there was a profound sense of camaraderie on the set and further encouraged by the most beautiful setting imaginable. And all of this had to be attributed to Clint Eastwood. Mitch could relax, maybe for the first time on a movie set or anywhere for that matter. He was almost two years sober and wondering how he had lived all those years under the cloud of alcohol when he walked away from the set to the bluff above the town on a sunlit day, Carson Peak towering 14,000 feet above him and the lake behind, he felt the gratitude of a man who had been saved from drowning. That's great. That's great. Uh, you know, I work with some of the people you work with and you've got them just exactly right. You also describe what it's like to work on a movie when it's all working like the one you did with Clint yeah. and that other, that other one where things are just a horror. horror. <laughs> yeah. uh, which is why I hope actors find the book and read the book yeah. uh, because it's very particular what it's like, what it's really yeah. like, which is so hard to explain to anybody who hasn't done it. Yeah. But what it's like to show up at a on a movie set when it's a good, wonderful, yeah. uh, safe place to be and when it's mm -hmm. a horror uh, yeah. and you've got all of those. Do you want to open this up? Uh, I, I, I do, but I want to ask a question of Paula, if that's OK. Uh, Paula, you know, most of us growing up in the 60s were in love with you. You know that. And we were most in love with you with where the boys are. And because of that movie, 
that little Fort Lauderdale spring break movie with a bite. And you are so perfect in that. And if anyone in this room hasn't seen it, get off <laughs> right now and go watch it. But what came after was all that dreck with, you know, all the other beach movies. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like? I believe that was your, I don't think it was your first film. I think it was your second, but I may be wrong. Where the boys are, that was the first film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was on a contract. I was so lucky to have a contract. I'm getting paid some money. So what they gave me was suitable for me in their eyes. I was tall and Jim Hutton was tall. So I did several movies with him. I hadn't had any experience in the, the real showbiz. So to me, it seemed fine. Yeah. But Paula, I don't think that's quite true. You and Richard met as students and I'm not sure the audience knows that. So uh, you, you were both studying acting together. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, at Northwestern University. Yeah. We met at Northwestern, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And they discovered her at Northwestern. Uh, Talent Scout came out there in a blizzard in February and we did a scene for him. He had no interest in me. I could see that immediately and tried to look around me and everything to find her. And then in June of that year, she got a call and said, uh, there's a part for a tall, beautiful girl in a movie. Uh, would you come out here and, and test for it? And uh, she did. And she called me and she said, I passed the test. <laughs> uh, and I said, what is it? You passed it. Does that mean you're in this movie? She said, yes, I think so. They said, I passed it. Mm -hmm. uh, this fellow also discovered Salome Jens at Northwestern. No, 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 no. no. Pat Neal. Oh, Neal. Right. Yeah, he Pat, he discovered Neal. Pat Neal. Neal. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I don't know up. about your early career or anything like that, but you were magnificent and as you like it. <laughs> oh, I know yeah. you're not talking to me. That, <laughs> and I, I know that. You, yeah. st you stood out in a wonderful little small part. <laughs> yes, yes. That so, didn't have uh, any lines. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking at everyone who's here. Most of you have been either to Italy or to France with the Freeds. Um, and as I look at this group, if I'm lucky enough to go tomorrow, I think I'm the only one online who will be, not tomorrow, on Wednesday, I'll be going to France. But Richard, you and Paula made a little movie in the south of France, and I heard you read about it. And I, I would hope that you would talk a little bit about the French food that you discovered on the way out while you were making The Last of Sheila, which of course was written by Stephen Sondheim and your friend, Anthony Perkins. About the food? Yeah, you, you discovered the food at the last, about the hotel. Oh yeah, well, yeah. It was such a uh, great story in your book. Well, I know, but aren't we talking about Mitch's book? It's up to Mitch. If Mitch wants to talk, he can talk. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I like to concentrate on that. I mean, yes, we, I mean, we, we, people eat so late in France and, and we were, we'd be outside these restaurants at seven o'clock with our tongues hanging out. But those people you uh, relate and all of that. But I, but I, I have a question for uh, Mitch that and people in, the, in this meeting, we were all there as Mitch read so many parts of this. Um, Mitch, something changed or something, at least my perception of it. I mean, all the times you read, which were always so wonderful. Um, did something change from the time or is it just that it's coherent now? It's all one thing. I feel something is is different. It's all of a piece. Is that it? Um, there's, there's there's something to that. Um, I and um, it's interesting that uh, I felt that myself when I when I sat down and read it all together. Um, before I uh, sent it off to the publishers. And it did have a different kind of cohesion to it or something. Well, I, don't, I don't know what it was exactly that it, it had taken on a different kind of life than the fragments that I read in the class, which all had to fit in together, I guess. 
I, I mean, yeah. I, I really I don't felt, know. I felt that. I wonder if our other friends here who were all there for when you read it, if they if there's the same feeling of that. Uh, it's not. Him. It's not. It's not that they're. It's not that they're different, uh, but there's something about it that uh, is even larger than uh, what it would be of reading. Reading just reading excerpts, but there's more than that. It's even maybe style. There's some sense of style that's different. Well, I'm it gonna, could be. I'm going to make a suggestion that we open up. Everyone unmute themselves because we're small enough, and yeah. just remember that if you cough the camera will go on you. So Barry, maybe you better stay muted. <clears throat> <laughs> he knows what I so mean. Would anyone like to maybe comment on that or talk yes, to him? Please, may I say that the name of the book, which nobody has mentioned, is The Fall of the Sparrow. Yes, painful. Mitch read that from Hamlet. Dorothy, you need to speak louder. He said, Mitch just read that quote from Hamlet, which I understood now more yes. than and you know, I, I must say that Robert Godwin, who's on with us, put in the comments when we did it last time with Donald, exactly where Fall of a Sparrow came. And Lawrence Carno in the bottom left of my screen, who's my first cousin, when I showed him the book at my house on Thursday afternoon, he goes, oh, Hamlet. He knew exactly where it was. Oh, so God. I really believe that there are a lot of people who we read do. Shakespeare. But I, I like to say uh, to Charlotte, too, who's about to be published. And I was fortunate enough to publish my two little memoirs. And uh, what you just said, Mitch and Richard, was so true about sitting down and reading the whole thing differently mm -hmm. from cover to cover. It's a kind of cohesion if that's the word. And one, even though one's written these and you, we've lived with our writing for so long, you definitely get a different perspective of the whole thing when you read it cover to cover. You know, an interesting sure. thing too is uh, when, when uh, this is uh, after Donald had done a lot of content uh, editing and Marsha had done a beautiful job of editing and I'm going over it and I find things that are implied. Yes. That are so incredible that yes. one word illuminated the whole thing, added. For Amazing. instance, she, um, uh, my mother says, he was for all time. When she's dead and I come in and see her dead, and know that it's over and that I had a line something like <clears throat> she's uh, she had been a part of my life and given me so much and I had never really uh, uh, showed any kind of and then it came to me in my life she was for all time sort of added to that situation mm. and things like that would come up you know i i want to make a, one comment um i have <clears throat> to say that i was late to this party i joined in 2017 i wish someone would have handed me the rule book when i walked in and i <laughs> walk in from literally the chicken counter at the farmer's market and there, Patty invites me and says, you're coming on Saturday. And I walk in and I go, oh, yeah, there's Richard Benjamin, who's been, who I've only idolized since I was a teenager. And, but Paula wasn't there. And I was really upset because she had already left the class. <laughs> and then I re met these wonderful people like uh, Gloria, uh, Gloria St uh, Struck. And I thought, oh, my God, I have died and gone to heaven. I, I never needed to work in the film industry because I always should have been a writer. So with that said, I need to say this. Richard Benjamin is by far the most wonderful person I think I've ever met. Oh, he's so oh. kind. And <laughs> he says to Mitch, to th this focus today is on Mitch. And he, all, he doesn't want the focus on him, yet there is always focus. And when you're in our class, we are very, very careful to protect those of you that are 
notorious. We're notorious, you're, you, you're whatever. So with that, I wanna turn it over to my friend, Shirley, who none of you know. Shirley, I know I've, she doesn't want to, but Shirley has actually read the book from cover to cover. And so Shirley, if you wouldn't mind just unmuting for a second, and maybe you have a question for Mitch because of all of these people in here, we've all heard bits and pieces of it. Mm -hmm. You got it fresh. I want to say, Mitch, that it, it was a wonderful read. And I'm not good at watching movies and probably saw you and didn't know who you were or anything, but there was so much, oh, just, the way it's written, the way it made me feel. I've been going through some rough times. And I was, what I came out of it was, what a wonderful, wonderful read. And that what I had been reading was trash. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm getting well, rid of surely, trash. Surely <laughs> is there a question in there? <laughs> oh. Throw a... It's okay, you, you, yeah, you can be a I, fan. Yeah, and it, it, folks, you just have to know that Shirley and I have known each other for, mm. I don't know, since 1985, and our lives come together only when we're both in chaos, which is right now, and we also separate, and then we come back together, and mm -hmm. when we're private, I'll tell you how we know, but it's not important. Now I'm going to open it up to can I Can I ask, um, can I ask, Barbara, are you, were you, are you there when he's writing? She's she's muted. Oh, are, you, are, you just, are you talking to me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> are you there while he's actually writing? Um, sometimes, sometimes um, he has his own office that he's sitting in, and I have my own little studio that I work in. But yeah, he, and and it's it's fairly private, and I don't bother him about it. Do you, do you read, does he say, uh, read this, read this chapter or anything like that? No, he doesn't. <laughs> but mm. he's always happy when I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me ask a quick question if Barry Soroka wouldn't mind unmuting for a second. Um, Barry, can you hear me? Sometimes he, he can't hear with his hearing aids. Um, Barry, um, tell the group how much of my current book you have read? None. <laughs> Absolutely none. Donald forbade Gary to forbid everybody to show it to their loved ones. And I must tell you that he sat in on the reading that we did of my play and I, I had only one other person other than uh, Lisa and Steve and some Lance was there and uh, I'm trying to remember who else and you know that seems so long ago um, and now Stefan, you know, Stefan, he's very excited about it. So I let Barry sit in on the reading and afterwards, his job was to record the reading. He screwed it up. So I have no recording of it. And Lance, you were there. We all went out for dinner afterwards. And I said to Barry, how did you like it? And he goes through page by page and he says, you know, this page is way too long. This page is way too long. And I closed the book and I said, you'll never read it let somebody else be the critic. Anyone else like to, uh, Phyllis, can I call on you? Yes. We had lunch last Monday and that was the first time I asked you to talk about your father. Do you, are you comfortable in doing that to this group? Talk about my father? This yeah, is just- the, the I'm her right. father. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we talk about my father? It's Richard's it's Luke. Because you, you told a story that re relates to something that Richard read from his book about what, what did you think of your father and the chicken ranch that he ran? People are gonna think that it's Las Vegas. It's not that kind of chicken ranch. My father always wanted to be a chicken farmer. And I have a wonderful picture of he and his mother feeding the chickens. <laughs> but my father lost the farm when he married my mother. He was 19, she was 20. Their, her, his parents objected and, and took the farm away from him. And my father was a crook. <clears throat> he was basically dishonest. He was a betting man and he took advantage of everybody that he could, but he was also completely unsuccessful. 
how does that relate to Richard? <laughs> well, Richard, you weren't in the class when he just, I'm not gonna ask him to do it, but there was a story that you wrote that resonates with me about a day at the races. I'm just gonna say that. Day at the races. You, you went with your family to a day at the races, the I horse did. races. Was there another Richard Benjamin in there? Do you <laughs> oh, there I were two of you. I think it was. Um, uh, I used to go to the track with my father. Oh, I know what you mean. I think when, uh, me. yeah, when Walter met Yeah, when Walter. I to do a yeah, promo. Yeah, I got a uh, Charlotte. I have a I question for you, Charlotte. Promo, please stop. Wait, wait. Um, uh, well, hold on, Marsha. One second. You'll be next. Okay. Let, let Richard finish. Well, no, I, I, I. Uh, there was a whole. Yeah, well, I think there was, it was a whole uh, thing about your your sister leaving something at the roadside, and you had to keep. Uh, coming that's back. An, yeah, that's another. That has nothing to do with the, the track. These are all mixed up things. What's your question? Um, anyway, I wanted to ask Charlotte something about. Did you see the Muhammad Ali? Yes, I certainly did. And weren't you there? Yes, I certainly was. <laughs> were, you, were you at the Rumble in the Jungle or the no, Thriller in Manila? Hot, but after the after the time spent there and getting to know that awful place and all of the horrors of it. Charlotte, I, I need you to speak louder. And louder? someone, someone, I'm going to ask everybody to mute because what's happening is I'm getting feedback and it won't show on the recording. So mute, learn how to mute and unmute. And then that way, the problem is we're getting feedback and we're not gonna have a good recording. And Charlotte, I want you to tell your story because I was not in the class, but I know your story because we've talked. So a little bit louder, please. Yes, can you hear me now? No, it's gotta be louder. We what hear her. Make it louder? No, we hear her. Okay, good, good, good. She, she okay. just needs to sit closer to the mic. Are you on a Mac? No, 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 I'm on a, a it's desk. It's fine, it's good. Okay, good, go. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the whole scene of being in Zaire, which is a, was a horrible place led, led by a horrible person. And the whole experience was amazing. But after the fight, which was brilliant, I, Muhammad Ali, who had become my friend over a long period of time, I knew him really well. And he's one of the finest, most generous, most loving, sweet human beings I've ever known. And he invited me and the man I was with to uh, his uh, uh, compound for breakfast. And as we were speaking, his new wife in her uh, full appropriate garments that suit the, the ritual of the religion, she came in looking very Muslim and very sincere and she was carrying their newborn baby. And, my, and Ali, reached for the baby and picked him up with his hand as if it was a football <laughs> because his hands are so huge. And then we had a wonderful time. And then when we stepped out, there were about a dozen young <laughs> boys, nine, 10 years old, who were just dying to get close to Muhammad Ali. And he'd started to play a game of you know fake boxing. And every time they touched him, he fell down. <laughs> they got absolutely hysterical. It, it, he, it was an extraordinary experience uh, in a thousand different ways. And every experience I've ever had with him has been that, in terms of being in Soho one day and walking down and, uh, he stopped and I didn't know where he'd gone and I was looking for him. He was sitting on the curb and he was sitting next to a homeless man and he was trying to persuade the homeless man to let him help him. He wanted to get him, uh, give him dinner. He wanted to get him a job. He wanted to find him a place to live. And the man said, leave me alone. I don't want to go away. And he cried uh, with such abject disappointment that this man wouldn't allow him to help. There's a million stories like that. So I just, thought I'd share that now that he's that documentary was so beautiful. I was so glad to see, gonna, it. Did see it. Because our time is almost up, I'd like to do two things to wrap up. I'm going to ask every person to unmute just for a second. We have actually three more minutes before we're done. And those who want to stay on, I'll stop the recording, but we really want to keep it to a short recording. Otherwise, no one will ever look at it. The first question I'm going to ask is I want everyone to think of their favorite movie that starred or was directed by someone that you see in this room? That's the first question. And the second question was, I forgot what the second question was. The first question, let's start with that. So the, your favorite, it could be a movie that you were in. It could be a movie 
that someone else in this room was in. Does anyone want to start? My favorite year. <laughs> That's 22. Mine too. We have our bag, Marsha. We have our bag you gave us. Yes, we yeah. do. Yeah. Monty Walsh, who was in that? <laughs> That's, well, a there's, um, um, That's a great one. There's a, a uh, about uh, 60 movies I did. About 57 are really awful. <laughs> but a couple of them are good. <laughs> I, I guess the question should have been, what's the worst question? And I should have included stage work because where I fell in love with the theater was long before I saw Richard and Paula nine times in Los Angeles when you did the Norman Conquest. I oh, was a wow. college student. I had to see how you went out of the dining room and into <laughs> around and round the garden. And that was Alan Eckenberg. I can't pronounce his last name at the moment, but you know who I mean. And so my mind for that point alone, I mean, forget the fact, Portnoy's complaint, goodbye Columbus, which changed my life. It told me never to go to Columbus, uh, <laughs> Ohio ever. Um, so yes, my favorite year, but Richard, when I asked you in class one day, have you ever, Barry and I have a favorite musical and it's called My Favorite Year. And I don't think you've ever heard the music of it. No, no, they, I know it, uh, we, I had nothing to do with it. None of us in the production had anything to do with that. So uh, the next time I see you, I'm gonna gift you my, do you still have a CD player because, or maybe you still have an LP? Uh, no, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for the offer of giving okay it. i got but that, it but that's okay that's okay i wanted uh, to ask mitch something um it's a wonderful sequence when the director is fired from electric guide in blue yeah. and you know where i mean yes exactly yeah yeah and that's wonderful how that's tied in with tim yeah. because because the, Tim kept asking you about saying something. You do say something, and Connie Hall says something. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, because of uh, Blake's behavior, yeah. um, but how that it's beautifully tied in to your relationship with Tim. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to uh, live up to something that I, I, I. You remember when the director was fired? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and Connie and, Hall was a, a DP. And Connie Hall was a DP and uh, and uh, director and writer. He wrote the thing, too. Yeah, he wrote it, yeah. A and uh, Blake didn't like the way he was doing it. And he wasn't, he wasn't really great, but he needed help. He needed somebody to help him. You yeah. Know? And uh, he had a lot of good ideas, and obviously it was a pretty good script. And uh, Blake just... Uh, Finally fired him, you know, had, had called Hollywood and they got rid of him, which was just horrible in front of the cast. Yeah. I mean, he's wonderful. And I, I was, I was, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I finally, after he, the guy stormed off and got in his car and left, I said, that's no way to behave. Or, you know, I said something really innocuous and, he said, well, you could be next, you know, so I said, fuck you and went my way. But I mean, it was like unbelievable. I, I mean, finally yeah. Connie really yeah. nailed him to the Yeah, that's, but it's wonderful how you tie that in with Tim. Yeah, and then I'm doing this in front of Tim. He's there with a couple of stuntmen who he, uh, he was visiting the set and having a great time. And, and, Can I uh, say that I love the part where you go looking for Tim and he's not knowing that he's dead and then you find him. I thought that was so touching and so yeah. beautifully written. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, Mitch, uh, someone asked me this morning, what do I want on my tombstone, believe it or not? <laughs> and I'm going to tell you my answer and I'm going to ask that question of you. What do you want to be most remembered for? But I'll start. I want on my tombstone, Gary Carno was a teacher of gifted children. What would you like on your tombstone? And let's hope it's not for another 30 years. 
I'm going to be cremated. <laughs> okay, that, that, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, Richard, uh, Paula, what do you most want to be remembered for in your lifetime? Well, I think the cremation is the choice that I've made, too. I'm not sure. Mm -mm. Oh, well, my children, they're the greatest. The, yeah. best, the best tombstone one that I ever heard was Johnny Carson's. On it, it says, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, Richard, if I were to ask you, what is your biggest achievement in life? I kind of think I know the answer, but do you want to tell us? Yeah, I can tell you. It's easy. It's to my right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah and paula what is your biggest achievement how many years have you been married 60 you know barry and i are only 37 and a half so oh, we, we don't know where we're gonna go we said we said to our daughter our anniversary is october 26 and we'll be 60 years and i said to our daughter prentice i said what do you give some what do you give someone who's 60 60 years anniversary she said dust <laughs> uh, oh, <God. laughs> Joanna, my, my dear Joanna, you have so many stories and your book is so wonderful and you've been so quiet. Is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, I think the only thing I'd like to say is how much I appreciate all of you incredibly talented and communicative people. And you're all uh, stars. In yeah, the, it's, the it's, real it's, sense of the word. <laughs> this, what this, did, what, it's such a nice thing. What did one. you want to say, Marsha? Didn't you want to say something? I yeah. did. I wanted to do a promo. Oh. Be, before you close this, Phyllis was, was kind enough to note that nobody had mentioned the name of the book, and she held up the book. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that this book is one of a pair. And that uh, a special providence is due to be released soon. We don't know exactly when, but uh, you want to you want to get both, folks. <laughs> so, you know, I, if, if you enjoy Mitch's reading, I, I think Mitch is this right? You you like a special providence better than you like Sparrow. I think it's better written, yeah. Okay, so I have a special announcement for everyone that I was saving for the end. On the first Sunday in June at 1.30 in the afternoon, I, I said June and I meant December. The first Sunday in December, hold that date. Barry and I are hosting in our home a uh, book, book signing. And yeah. it's only for people who have bought the book and who are friends of us and friends of the class. So it's a party for anyone who's been part of the writer's seminar. And I hope that you'll come with your book. Uh, it will be a, a catered affair, as they say. Um, it will be in the afternoon. Uh, Barry and I don't drink. So if you're looking for alcohol, stop at a bar on the way here. Um, <laughs> but there will be a very lovely, um, uh, lovely things. I, I don't want to say too much. So we'll start at 1.30 um, and Mitch will read at 2. Um, he'll sign books and uh, you're all welcome to stay as long as you want. If it rains, our living room can hold Bob. I'm asking Bob because Barry won't know. Bob's been in our living room. Actually, a lot of you have been. I think we can hold 100 people, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Very friendly people. <laughs> okay, well, if the weather's nice and I open up the doors, because when, when we had the birthday parties here, we had a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah you had about uh, 50 people the fairly comfortably. Well, we actually um, had 150 people. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that was we included the outside. That was included the yeah, outside. So if it's a nice day, and that's why we're doing it 1.30, the beauty of our house is there's street parking, so there'll be no valet. There's plenty of street parking. So you'll get it. I'm not obviously saying where the house is because this is going out on the internet. But um, this exclusive group, the, my friends on Facebook, um, we will end my launch of the book on December and where it goes from here. Uh, Mitch has press agents. He'll have all kinds of things. Um, Donald's idea is that we start small and we grow. And so I want to thank, oh my gosh, Paula, 
when I got to have lunch with you and Phyllis, and Phyllis said, I'm going to lunch with Paula, and I got <laughs> to come along. And I was late for an appointment that Barry wasn't too happy that we were late, but we had a wonderful couple of lunches, and we've had dinners, and we've had all kinds of things since. And so each of you, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I don't want to have the last word. I want thank Mitch you. to have the last word because it's all about Mitch today. So Mitch, this is your chance. Last word. <laughs> so folks, I'm going to stop recording. It doesn't mean you have to leave. I'm going to stop recording.